Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we'll be watching History Summarized Byzantine Empire Beginnings by Overly Sarcastic Productions. Now, I have really enjoyed OSP's videos on Rome, and I'm excited to get into the Byzantine Empire. Now, if you guys end up enjoying this video, I would appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below, and will give you access to exclusive reaction content. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this video. You ever lie awake at night thinking wistfully about the Roman Empire, or is that just a me thing? Uh, I think a lot of my audience does, to be honest with you. <laughs> <sighs> this is so sad. Okay. Alexa, play Roman Empire 2. <laughs> Roman Empire 2, or, oh. well, more realistically, just a continuation of the Roman Empire. Hey, there's no Roman Empire 2. The Byzantine Empire, it still is the Roman Empire. <gasps> Shocker. Hell yeah, this is my jam. You see, the big plot twist of the fall of Rome is that it didn't. While the West was off collapsing mm -hmm. and turning into medieval Europe, the East carried on being the Roman Empire for another thousand years. Yeah, and I really liked how they covered this in their videos on the Roman Empire. Like I said, I've really enjoyed OSP's videos on Rome. I really appreciate their perspective because in my opinion, they're exactly right. You know, we see the fall of the Western Roman Empire, which is often seen as the fall of Rome. But even after the fall of the West, the Eastern Roman Empire continues, continues for another thousand years. Now, over those thousand years, it does go into a terminal decline, but at times it holds a significant amount of power. And at times we can think, say, under Justinian, it actually reclaims a substantial amount of that territory that was lost when the West fell. So yeah, the Byzantine Empire, well, it is just a continuation of the Roman Empire. I guess more specifically, the Eastern Roman Empire. When Rome supposedly falls, well, that's only the West that's fallen. First question, how? And two, a millennium is a long time. What traits stuck to the classical roots and what innovations came in during the medieval period? Very good question. I mean, Rome is only able to survive for this long because it is able to adapt. And that adaptability is a trait that will very much continue during the Byzantine Empire. I'm fine with using that name. Some people want to avoid it entirely. It's not a title that would have been used at the time, but for the sake of clarity, I'm fine with using the name Byzantine Empire because, you know, people know what you're talking about when you say that. To see how we got from point R to point B, let's do some history. <laughs> this video is brought to you by nobody. I just oh. kind of wanted to say hi and that I hope you're having a good day. Thank hope you. Enjoy my fun history video. You too. <laughs> Our story begins in the early 300s AD with a yes. barely standing Roman Empire now split into four administrative regions. And yes, Diocletian at his Tetrarchy. Now look, I'm a big Diocletian fan. I'm a big Tetrarchy fan. I know a lot of people, they pine for the days of the unified Roman Empire and it will, you know, become unified after this and then we'll split apart again and... But I frankly think that Diocletian had an eye for the future. He saw what was coming. The empire could no longer survive as this unified entity. There were too many issues to deal with. In order to keep the empire alive, it had to be divided into different administrative regions. And frankly, you know, Diocletian split it into four. It ended up being split into two. But I think he was on the right track with his idea. In the hopes of easing the govern- oh no, they're already fighting each other. Yep. <laughs> Gross. Alright, look away kids, this is messy. Flash forward two decades, Constantine reconquers everything, picks up- Yeah, so the Tetrarchy works really well under Diocletian. Once he leaves, it all falls apart, all the different Augustuses and Caesars are fighting each other, and then Constantine comes along and reunifies Rome. Uh, it's a great achievement, certainly, but it doesn't really mean much for the longevity of the empire, to be honest with you. Christianity along the way and decides that the empire really needs a new capital. So he picked the ancient site of Byzantium at the northeast corner yep. of the Aegean Sea as it stood at the crossroads of the Black Sea and the Mediterranean and was closer to the rich and well-urbanized provinces of the east. So it would be the perfect spot. That's a great map. Now, I don't know where this graphic is from, and to be fair, you really cannot estimate the wealth level of these provinces accurately, but if we take this with a massive grain of salt, and we take it very generally, very generally, I do think this tells us some truths about the empire. First off, 
look at the Italian peninsula, still it historically has been the heartland of the empire, still very rich, though it is also having a hard time, and it will, you know, enter into decline. Um, although, oh, this is 14 AD also, so this is way before the time period we are talking about. So, 14 AD, this is a time when Italy truly is the heartland of the empire. When we get to, like, 300 AD, which is what we're talking about, yeah, Italy's becoming less and less important, but I do think this highlights basically the relative wealth of the eastern provinces. You can look at Egypt in particular, always very wealthy. And so I do think that is something that would hold true for a long, long time, um, you know, would hold true in the time period that we are now talking about for a new imperial city. After six years of whirlwind and kind of shoddy construction, Constantine consecrated the city in 330 as the new Rome, much to the annoyance of the Romans back in, hmm. you know, the first Rome. Yeah. But reunifying an empire and introducing an entirely new religion comes with some challenges, and <laughs> Constantine soon found Christians fiercely debating the nuances of Trinitarian theology. Yep. Academic discussion about church doctrine is all well and good until the Alexandrians started rioting about it. So Constantine exerted some imperial authority to keep Christianity under control. And, and here begins the imperial intervention in Christianity. This will become a long and storied tradition, and I think they framed it pretty accurately. You know, Christianity had a lot of doctrinal disputes from very early in Christian history. Uh, I mean, same with a lot of religions, but there was a lot of debates over doctrine, uh, you know, biblical doctrine, the ideas of Christianity, what did this mean, what did that mean? And while that's sort of fine in academic sense, I don't think that's a problem, it is a problem if you were trying to use this religion as a unifying force within the empire. And that's one of the things that Constantine and later these Christian emperors would do. They wanted to use Christianity as a uniting force. And so if you have all these doctrinal disputes and disagreements, that's not going to fly. And so what do you do? Well, you step in and you nudge the church in one direction or the other. And if the nudge doesn't work, well, you might have to get even more heavy-handed. Like I said, we have a long tradition of this, with the emperor getting involved in religious disputes in order to prevent them from spiraling into real-world disputes, though they still do. <laughs> we still end up with a lot of religious and real-world disputes, despite the interference of the emperor. Instead of the tried-and-true method of lions, he held the church-wide Council of Nicaea for bishops to negotiate a universal and legally binding orthodoxy of the empire. Mm -hmm. Now, this being the Romans we're talking about, pretty much nothing can stop these people from finding a single excuse to throttle each other, but <laughs> broadly speaking, the Council of Nicaea did the trick and established a consistent theological and political framework for Roman Christianity. Very broadly speaking, it is of course far more complicated than that, but they are very right to point out that the Council of Nicaea a really important point in Christian history, a really important point in establishing Christian orthodoxy, and it largely would do that, which is why it's so important. These two changes marked the start of the East's geographical and religious divergence from the old empire, but things really accelerated in the century after. We've talked about this before, so I'll breeze through most of it, but after Constantine's three sons got into a civil war with each other, no surprise there. Yeah, the no surprise, but come on, Constantine, I will reunify the empire, none of this tetrarchy business. That's great, man, great achievement, but what happens when you're gone? Well, everything falls apart again. <laughs> His most tragic introvert, Julian, got dragged kicking and screaming into being the Roman Emperor. Whereupon, he spent two years trying and failing to reconvert the Empire to paganism before being speared to death while on a poorly organized campaign in Persia. Yes, they're talking about Julian the Apostate. I think he's a fascinating character. He was a pagan. He was an academic. He loved to look back on the old Roman religion, the old Roman virtues, the old Roman way of doing things. I think he was a man of great intelligence. He was pretty talented. Unfortunately, he didn't make it that far. He didn't manage to achieve his goals. Perhaps if he had lived longer, who knows the influence he could have had? We don't know. 
Um, but I personally think Julian is a really fascinating individual. Then a series of unremarkable emperors took turns doing absolutely nothing to solve the serious problems the Empire still <laughs> faced after Constantine, such as wars, weak administration, and a wimpier army than Rome was used to having. Sure, Constantine mm -hmm. pulled the hard carry to give the Empire another century of life, but things were still looking mighty grim. In yeah. comes Theodosius, an emperor who had the wild card idea to permanently bisect the Empire into an independent eastern and western half. Wild, but once again, uh, this is exactly what we're heading towards. And, you know, on this map, we see Constantinople and Rome. But to be honest with you, at this point, Rome was not that important. <laughs> Rome had been declining in importance for, I mean, we're talking hundreds of years at this point. Cities like Mediolanum, or most notably Ravenna, were becoming the more important cities within Italy. Sure, Rome still held a lot of significance to Roman culture and Roman identity, but in terms of the practical importance of these cities, Rome, the city, was in decline big time. So it's here in 395 that the Byzantine Empire officially gets going, but that's technically a misnomer as nobody called the Eastern Empire Byzantine until the 1500s. Yep. Yep. Exactly. That is exactly the point I was making. While the Byzantine Empire was alive, it was not called the Byzantine Empire. This is a name that has been applied to it retroactively. The Byzantines, they saw themselves as Romans. They saw their empire as the Roman Empire. Simple as that. So, you know, in some ways, the, the term Byzantine Empire is sort of a misnomer. Now, like I said, I don't have too much of an issue with it. Because people sort of get confused when you talk about the Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire. When you say the Byzantine Empire, everybody knows what you're talking about. And so, for the sake of clarity, I'm willing to use the term Byzantine Empire. I use it interchangeably with Roman Empire. Some people don't want to use it at all because they feel it's inaccurate. They feel it is truly a misnomer and should not be used. And I understand that, you know. I think it's fine to use the term Byzantine Empire for the sake of clarity, as long as we keep in mind that they wouldn't have used it at the time. I and mean, we, we use a lot of historical terms that wouldn't have been used at the time, and yet we still use them for the sake of clarity and understanding. That's my perspective on the whole thing. As far as every single one of its inhabitants was concerned, they were Romaioi, yep. just as Roman as their forebears like Caesar and Constantine and the rest. But back to the Western Imperial collapse at hand, this split effectively doomed the West, though it put the East in a position to stay strong, productive, and cohesive <laughs> for centuries. So if Theodosius implicitly sentenced Western Rome to death, then his successors plunged the knives by responding to the perilous threat of Gauls by just paying them to go West instead. Basically. Oh, no Look, uh, at this time, both the East and the West were in a whole lot of trouble. There was a lot of chaos, violence, instability going on. I do think the East was usually able to handle it better. There was typically a little more stability in the East. The East maintained more of a political elite, a political class than the West did. The West descended into basically just full military governance, everything was run by generals, constant fighting, constant chaos. The East was a lot like that too. Generals had outsized power and influence over the emperors, but I do think, like I said, that the East did manage to maintain more political institutions and more of a political class than the West did. Noble. Meanwhile, the Western emperors were too feckless to stop very simple problems from boiling over into Rome getting sacked. Yeah. Twice. But the Byzantine defense strategy was more than just making everything Italy's problem. At the turn <laughs> of the 5th century, Constantinople outgrew its first fortifications and began building the Theodosian Walls, yes. a massive set of three-tiered ramparts that defended the city for the next thousand years. Yeah, the next thousand years. And if you want to talk about the defense of Constantinople, you have to talk about the Theodosian Walls. They did their job many times over. These truly impressive uh, defenses that really were able to protect the city for a thousand years. I think partially because the sort of resources the Byzantine Empire was able to marshal at this time. Well, if we look at the next thousand years, it's pretty rare that other empires were able to marshal 
those sort of resources and perform that sort of construction. Even the Byzantine Empire itself would struggle to do similar things in the future. <laughs> so it's a good thing they got them built now because they really would last and like I said, they would really do their job. But even the strongest walls couldn't save the Byzantine Empire from its greatest danger yet. Sports. See, the Byzantines <laughs> loved yep. their chariot races. They were fanatics about it, and they aligned themselves with either the blue or the green. The blues and the greens. You can tell me down below if you're a fan of either the blues or the greens, these two chariot racing groups. But at times, they played a deeper role than that. These sort of sports teams also became, it sometimes, basically roaming gangs, mob-like groups, uh, political enforcers, you know, they actually had a lot of influence within the Byzantine Empire, especially in Constantinople itself. They were a lot more than just sports teams. Team. Ah, yes, I see no way in which this rabid tribalism could possibly ever go wrong. <laughs> but this, unsurprisingly, rapidly spun out of control as the Blues yeah. and the Greens began butting heads on politics and religion and then yep. started throwing hands about it in the middle of church. It's like a big medieval kingsman fight up in there. <laughs> but by far, the worst riots broke out during the reign of the Emperor Justinian. Ah, uh, the, the Nika riots. Uh-oh. In his early in his reign. His father Justin came from humble beginnings and rose through the military ranks to rule the empire in one of history's rare few reverse regencies, where the younger Justinian was the power behind his father's throne. While he wasn't pulling the imperial strings, Justinian was Yeah, they came from nothing. Uh, I believe they were sort of provincial farmers. Justin worked his way up militarily, gained the position at the top, and Justinian was able to rise up along with him and then become the more prominent of the two, and then take his own position on the throne. Falling in love with the famed actress Theodora, and they together yeah. would become Theodora, who also came from a very, very humble background, an actress which was not at all respected at that time, uh, in some ways was sort of synonymous with being a prostitute. Uh, it was not viewed very favorably at that time the ultimate power couple of the 6th century. Yeah. So, back to the riots, Emperor Justinian tried to curb the influence of the Blues and Greens in politics and succeeded only in irritating both of them so badly that they teamed up in an open revolt. Mm -hmm. These wily sports fans shouted victory chants and poured out of the chariot stadium to light Constantinople on fire for five straight days. Justinian was ready to hop on a ship and bail the hell out of there, but Empress Theodora told him to face his fate with honor and live or die. Yeah, this is a very famous quote, particularly the royal purple is the noblest burial shroud. Justinian was ready to get the hell out of there, regroup, save his life. Theodora, she said, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> we've made it this far. We came from nothing. We're going to defend our position at any cost. And so Justinian turned to his loyal commander, Belisarius, who will continue to be very, very important throughout Justinian's life. And, uh, well, just say they put down the riots. As an emperor, and that is part of why she is the biggest badass this side of Cleopatra. I really wish I had more time to talk about Theodora, but suffice to say that she is absolutely worth reading up about. The mm. Nika riots ultimately fell to the blade during a bloody massacre in the stadium, and Justinian was left to pick up the charred pieces of his ruined city. So yeah, he an extremely bloody massacre. Uh, this was a very violent end to the Nika riots, and like I said, uh, Justinian had turned to Belisarius. So you see some of the characters who will be important throughout the life of Justinian. Theodora, of course, Belisarius. Immediately set about rebuilding Constantinople even shinier than before, and that meant a new centerpiece church, the Hagia Sophia. Yes. In an evolution from your standard Roman temples, this one's got a dome. Oh, yeah. In a doubly brilliant move, the dome is ringed with windows, which cast an ever-changing light onto the gold mosaics, and the halo effect makes the dome look like it's damn near floating. When just yeah, and the Hagia Sophia was truly an amazing sight. Like, people honestly could not believe the grandeur when they saw it. And once again, this is sort of a testament to the resources that Justinian was able to marshal at that time, because for a thousand years onwards, people who visited uh, Constantinople, who saw the Hagia Sophia, you know, whether we're talking about the year 700, 1,000, 1,300, you know, through the sort of medieval era, visitors to Constantinople were extremely impressed by the Hagia Sophia and felt it as a, a real testament to Christianity, to God. It was this, 
you know, extremely uh, amazing structure, basically. Justinian entered the completed church for the first time, he's said to have muttered, Solomon, I have surpassed thee. We're <laughs> extremely lucky to still have this masterpiece of a church around today, albeit in a different form, and you can yeah. see the influence of its design all throughout the Eastern Mediterranean and well beyond the Empire's lifetime. Good dome. <laughs> Meanwhile, Justinian was also hard at work codifying hundreds of years of Roman laws into one standardized book. The Corpus Juris Civilis remains the basis of most European law codes to this day. Yeah, Just extremely influential. Once again, as with the Hagia Sophia, Justinian's law code, extremely influential, of course, within the empire, but also beyond. You know, we're talking about basically the entire Western world. We think about, you know... Roman civilization and how influential it was to, you know, the modern day West, basically Europe and countries influenced by Europe throughout the world. Well, that influence continued and we're seeing some of that here with Justinian. So some really, truly impressive stuff. And I think it's absolutely fair and justified that they're giving this much time to Justinian in this video on the beginnings of the Byzantine Empire. Because really, if you want to talk about sort of the early Byzantine Empire, you gotta talk about Justinian, he's such an important character. Justinian liked big ideas. One law, one church, <laughs> and one empire. Yeah. But this last one was a bit of a sticking point because the Roman Empire had been missing its Rome for over 50 years. Yes. So Justinian put Belisarius in charge of retaking the West. And retake he did because Belisarius is a freaking boss. True. For his first act. I mean, we did a series on Belisarius. Uh, we reacted to Epic History TV's videos, and Belisarius truly amazing. I mean, when we talk about some of the best partnerships throughout history, one might think of uh, Octavian slash Augustus and Agrippa, and here we have, rather similarly, Justinian and Belisarius. Justinian did the political side of things, Belisarius did the military side of things. A truly incredible duo, though. You know, Justinian would often distrust Belisarius, maybe wouldn't reward him fairly in the end, but Belisarius truly, truly impressive. He reclaimed Carthage and the North African coast from the Vandals, of all people, with minimal casualties in just under a year. To celebrate his spectacular victory, Justinian awarded Belisarius with a triumph, yeah. an honor no general had received since Caesar. With yep. this amazing foothold in the West, Belisarius- I mean, since Imperial Rome had begun, triumphs had been basically reserved for the emperors themselves. I mean, you didn't want to give a triumph to someone not within the imperial family. That would be a challenge to your own position. If we're going to do a triumph, it's going to be me, the emperor, who does it. And so Belisarius, in this extremely rare sight, is granted a triumph by Justinian because his conquests are that impressive, and they will only become more impressive launched his conquest of Italy. This would prove trickier, but with careful progression up the peninsula and inventive tactics like storming Naples by aqueduct, mm. Belisarius pushed all the way to Rome and made Hannibal look like a chump. As history will Damn. have you know, <laughs> marching on Rome is a right reserved only to Roman generals. Thank you very much. <laughs> the Ostrogoths put up a fierce counterattack and surrounded the city of Rome for nearly a year, but Belisarius held out and continued up to Milan and the political capital of Ravenna. But the problem with investing manpower into the west is that the east lay severely exposed, and when the Persian king Khosro heard word that the Byzantines were distracted, he- Khosro, we've also done a series on Khosro, uh, extra history series on Khosro. He is, in many ways, a parallel to Justinian. The two are often compared, I think fairly so. You know, Justinian is this impressive, sort of, <laughs> more rare than once in a generation, you know, this extremely rare, impressive Roman emperor who has a grand vision and does great things. Khosro is basically the equivalent for the Sassanid Persians. You know, he is, you know, two guys pretty similar, <laughs> just on different sides of the line invaded Mesopotamia. So now Justinian found himself split between two very distant fronts, with the Ostrogoths still carving out pockets of resistance over in Italy. All of this was made far worse by the sudden guest appearance of, surprise, the Black Death, which ravaged yeah. the Byzantines and the Persians alike. The empire would have surely collapsed if not for the Herculean efforts of Theodora, who kept it all in one piece while Justinian was busy recovering from a plague coma. In the yeah. middle of all of this, Ostrogoths sacked and destroyed Rome, leaving the city a complete ghost town and forcing Belisarius 
Belisarius to re-reconquer yeah, Italy go back. the boot to the Alps. This being Belisarius, of course he did, because he's the coolest <laughs> dude, but it took a really long time, and what was left of Italy was... Eh, pretty busted up. The one yeah. bright spot amid all this mess is the city of Ravenna, which soon became home to some splendid and miraculously preserved feats of Byzantine art and architecture. As early as- Yep, and that is where we get this image from, this very famous image of Justinian. It was preserved in Ravenna. the 500s, Byzantines had already gotten their golden aesthetic and talent for mosaics to near perfection. Over the course of his four decades in power, Justinian rebuilt Constantinople, codified the laws, standardized the church hierarchy, survived a plague, and reconquered the West. Or, or at least what was left of it. Right, some really impressive stuff. I mean, you want to talk about a reunifier of the empire. Well, Justinian is as close as you're going to get to that during the Byzantine era. He reclaims a large chunk of that western territory. I mean, if you look at a map of Rome under Justinian, you're like, well, that doesn't look like eastern Rome. I mean, that is most of Rome. I mean, we're missing some provinces, uh, you know, out west, really far out west, but he's doing a pretty damn good job. It accomplished a lot, but those accomplishments took a lot of resources, not to mention his reign is sort of capped off by the plague, which is extremely, extremely damaging. So, now we get to the aftermath of Justinian's reign. It doesn't go as smoothly as Justinian would have wanted. For better and worse, Justinian's reign was a massive step in the evolution of the Byzantine Empire. Yeah. And for all his efforts to reclaim Rome, Justinian's lasting legacy proved that the empire no longer really needed it. Yeah. And it's just as well, because three very short years after Justinian- Yeah, it's just as well, because they wouldn't keep it. ...and died, the Lombards came across the Alps, and by the end of the century, they had swiped two-thirds of Italy. Oops. Meanwhile, back in Constantinople, things were going somewhere between eh and oof. Emperor <laughs> yeah. Maurice was deposed by the army in favor of the completely incompetent Phocas, so the Persians used this as a perfect excuse for war and pushed all the way into Anatolia. I mean, look, it is very difficult to have several good leaders in a row. This is why we talk about, you know, the five good emperors in Roman history. You have someone like Justinian truly... And, you know, I don't think he was perfect. I think he made some mistakes. I think he overextended his resources. But this truly impressive leader, extremely capable, well, you got to have someone not as good afterwards. And so I think the Empire suffered from bad leadership following Justinian. I mean, in order to hold on to Justinian's conquests and keep his mission going, you would have needed some truly, a series of truly impressive emperors, which is... It's just not likely. Before diverting south to capture the Levant in Egypt. This was really bad and probably would have been a total game over if not for the miraculous arrival hey, of Heraclius. Heraclius! Uh, you know, we had a couple of bad emperors, but we have Heraclius, another very impressive emperor. He basically saves the Roman Empire, as we're about to see here. Son of North Africa's governor. He showed up, booted Phocas right on out of there, and assumed control of the empire. By combining civil and military authority, his government was flexible and better able to repel the Persian threat. Yep. After a long and hard fought- And by the way, it is worse than they're showing here. You know, the Sassanids had really brought the Byzantine Empire to its knees. I want to emphasize that. At one point, it looked like the Byzantine Empire might not make it. It might collapse here and now due to the Sassanid Empire. Heracles shows up. Not only does he defend Byzantine territory, but then he goes on the advance. Campaign that nearly bankrupted the empire, Heraclius pushed into the heart of Sassanid Persia and brokered a piece of, wait for it, status quo antebellum. Yep. After seven centuries of- I mean, that's not bad. <laughs> Given the fact that the Roman Empire had almost fallen right there and then, that is not a bad piece to land on. Romano-Persian Wars, going back to the Republic and the Parthians in 53 BC, both empires now stood battered to within an inch of their life, yeah. ending with the exact same borders that they started with. So, and I understand the point they're making, which is that overall, both empires ended up extremely weakened from where they had been, and nothing had changed. Now, within that, you have the Sassanids almost conquering the Romans, then Heraclius basically saving the empire, uh, cavorting through Sassanid territory, and forcing them into a treaty, which returned them to the status quo. At the end of it, what you have are these two great empires, these two great rivals, who were weakened, really weakened. They had basically brought each other to their knees. And so, you might imagine... 
you know, what could happen if a third power emerged, an ambitious, uh, quickly expanding power, and these two weakened empires were in their current state? What might happen? Hmm. Yeesh. But the longer-term consequences of this would become all too clear all too soon, as the newfound yep. Muslim Caliphate began there expanding out of Arabia. And, and that third power is the Caliphate. You know, Islam emerges, the Caliphate emerges, and it takes on these weakened giants, these weakened empires, and it does some serious damage. And neither Persia nor the Byzantines had the means to stop them. In nope. eight short years, the Rashidun Caliphate conquered the entire Levant, and within another ten, they had Egypt and Persia as well. Con yeah. I mean, the Caliphate destroyed the Sassanid Empire. It was no longer. They completely took it, and it crumbled. The Romans, well, the Roman Empire managed to survive, but Heraclius, though he had managed to fend off the Sassanids, he had reconquered Roman territory, he just couldn't resist the Muslim advance. He didn't have the resources. He was unable to do it. Though, to be fair, I'm really... Under those circumstances, I'm not sure anybody could have resisted the advance of the Caliphate. Constantinople itself nearly fell to an Arab siege, but they held out thanks to a neat little trick <laughs> called basically napalm. <laughs> By the end of the century, the Byzantine Empire found itself firmly shut out of the entire southern Mediterranean for good. Yep. Meanwhile, the other front wasn't looking that much better. What other front, you ask? Well, you see, Slavic forces had pushed down into the Peloponnese, splitting- Yep, now we have the Slavs showing up. Now they're part of the story, and they will remain part of the story. <laughs> half and leaving the empire looking like a checkerboard. Surprise! It's at least refreshing to see that the time-honored Roman tradition of spectacular territorial implosion is still <laughs> alive and well. So there's that. It's perhaps no coincidence that this chapter in Byzantine history is considered the beginning of the Dark Ages. Yes. You know, this is Roman history, so everything has to go up and down and up. You need you know, those great heights and the great valleys of Roman history. You started this off with the Tetrarchy, then a unified Roman Empire, and a split Roman Empire, then the West has fallen. But oh, Justinian's reconquered a lot of that territory. Now, oh, they've been battered by the Sassanids, but we came back, but the Caliphate has emerged, and now we've lost a whole lot of our territory. So now we've reached one of those low points of Byzantine history. <laughs> but we've still got over 700 years left on the clock. Yes. Amid all that land getting yoinked, it's easy to miss what else has changed, and easy to forget what continuity is still there. The Empire in 300 was pagan, bilingual in Greek and Latin, and spread out over the whole Mediterranean. Right, and I think this, why, this is why a lot of people have a hard time calling the Byzantine Empire the Roman Empire, right? They say it's the Byzantine Empire, it's completely separate from the Roman Empire. People have a really hard time because of all of the difference. But you got to remember, it's not like any of these things changed all at one time. Now, there were, you know, big points of change in some of these, but these were slow changes over a very long period of time. And we have continuity there, and that is why the Byzantine Empire... It is a continuation of the remaining existing Roman Empire, even though it would change a lot over time. The Empire now maintains the same core laws and form of government that Augustus had first established, but territorially and culturally, the Empire was becoming far more Greek. Its yeah. borders much more closely reflected the classical Greek world, Greek had become the official language, and the Empire's strongest literary legacy at this point was its preservation of ancient scholarship. Some two-thirds of all the ancient Greek texts we have today come to us from the Byzantines. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, it became a very Greek empire. A lot of the Greek culture we have today will descend from the Byzantine Empire, but at the same time, it was Roman. They identified themselves as Roman, they believed in that Roman tradition, they had, you know, the core of Roman law, so, you know, of course it's a complicated picture, um, but, you know, you don't have to be one or the other, it's not Greek or Roman, you know what I mean? There's sort of a combination there. Forget the Library of Alexandria. In the long run, it's the Library of Constantinople that really did the hard carry. On the other hand, all of this Greekness lets historians take pot shots saying that the Byzantine Empire isn't really the authentic right. Roman Empire. Blech. But we'll see how the Byzantines maintain that fundamentally Roman capacity yep. to adapt and evolve to survive and change exactly. circumstances. Exactly. Both literally and figuratively, the Byzantine Golden Age was just over the horizon. My god, like, so much gold mosaic. It's honestly <laughs> kind of insane. But, oh man, is it pretty. They, they loved it. Thank you so much for watching. They loved a good gold mosaic. All right, that was a great video. I always love OSP's history videos. Um, 
that I love their perspective on the Roman Empire. It really jives with my own perspective, which is, you know, why I like it so much. <laughs> but yeah, I totally agree. I agree with their perspective on the Byzantine Empire being a continuation of the Roman Empire, and I'm glad that we have more to get to. Uh, this is basically part one in a sort of three-part series. This is Byzantine Empire beginnings, then we have the Golden Age, then we have the fall of the Byzantine Empire. So uh, I'm excited to get to that. I really enjoyed this one. I, You know, we've done a fair amount of Byzantine history on this channel. I still feel like it's pretty underappreciated, to be honest with you. So I'm always glad when we get an opportunity to do more. If you guys enjoyed this one, I'd appreciate it if you would leave a like, subscribe, and check out the Patreon. It is linked down below. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, I hope you guys are having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.